So welcome everybody. It's it's great to have so many of you here and to um, celebrate in Eric's uh, PhD thesis defense. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a background. So Eric uh, did his bachelor's at Whitman College, um, and he where he um, well, I was actually going to look at your bio major, and then he went on to do a master's at the University of Illinois at Champaign Urbana and finished that in 2010. He did a couple years of teaching and then he was looking at PhD programs and the timing could not have been better. Uh, he, uh, we had just gotten the T grant, I see Tim Griffin there, and, and we were looking for a student to work on it. And if one, two things about Eric you have to know, which you probably, most of you already know, is that he is very passionate about T. And he's passionate about teaching and he's passionate about biology. The alignment was really good. He came to Tufts and I am so fortunate that he did that. Uh, since 2014, he's been working on his PhD, um, Indirect and Interactive Effects of Climate and Rivery on T Metabolites and Quality. And this work uh, took him to China several times. Dr. Wenyan Han, who's on, has been an amazing collaborator facilitating Eric's work. And I'm so appreciative of his and his whole groups, Li Xian and others, who have facilitated Eric's work in China. So um, in his time at Tufts, he's really developed some skills in plant biology, has done some really creative work on how to collect chemicals from plants using um, uh, sort of contact, sort of volatile collection using these absorptive um, things you put into the field. And he's worked really closely with the robot lab in the chemistry department and his students to develop ways of not only sort of analyzing those chemicals, but sort of thinking about how do you how do you analyze really complex mixtures of chemicals that are part of how plants respond to climate and herbivory. So. Um, he has really become quite the data analyst and visual and visualization. You'll see that in today's talk. Um, and he's also, I just want to say, he's really passionate about teaching. He, he taught general biology before coming to Tufts and that didn't scare him away. So that's a good sign. And since coming to Tufts, he's TA'd all sorts of courses here. He, He's been credited with really helping Sarah Lewis with transforming the lab program of biostats, and he's currently teaching ecological um, models and data, or ecological statistics and data. And um, his career goals are to be a teacher, and I know he has a really bright future ahead of him, and I'm gonna turn over the floor to Eric. So Eric, please. Thank you. All right, let me share my talk here. Okay, slides showing up? Yeah, cool. Um, all right, so thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I am gonna talk to you today about the uh, indirect and interactive effects of climate change and herbivory on tea. Um, so tea is uh, an important, well tea is important because it's grown in regions of the world that are um, really feeling the effects of climate change hard. Um, and climate change has the potential to affect tea in a direct way through changes um, uh, in temperature or uh, increases in drought and flooding, extreme events like that. But it also has the potential to affect tea indirectly because it can alter the populations of insects that feed on tea. Um, so this is a report from a nonprofit called the uh, Forum for the Future that they wrote about um, the future of tea. And in it, they call tea a hero crop or a potential hero crop. And that's because it has the potential to deliver social, economic, and environmental benefits to everyone in the supply chain from farmers all the way up to consumers. And in this report, they identify several hypothetical scenarios for the future where um, in the only scenarios where um, tea is actually able to live up to that hero uh, crop potential are scenarios where um, uh, farmers have the, uh, the, the tools and support of governments in order to adapt to climate change. Hold on just one second. Let me change my video here. Okay, there we go. Um, so I think a really important 
step for step in order to allowing tea to live up to its hero crop potential is understanding how the tea plant is going to be affected by climate change. So here's the tea plant. The Latin name is Camellia sinensis. It's a long-lived woody perennial tree or shrub um, and it's grown mostly in developing countries by smallholder farmers. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it has this uh, hero crop potential because there are many people that rely on it as a, an important cash crop. And the young leaves of the tea plant are used to produce uh, six categories of tea, including white tea, green tea, yellow tea, oolong, black tea, and fermented tea, or also called dark tea. And while processing can uh, change the quality of tea a lot, the quality is still largely determined by the growing conditions of the tea plant. So in other words, even the most skilled tea maker can't make the best tea unless they have the best starting material. So we can further kind of subdivide or, or categorize tea into commodity tea and specialty tea. So commodity tea is going to be things like bottled tea that's ready to drink or bagged tea or instant tea. Um, it's generally um, picked by relatively low paid workers earning, you know, often uh, poverty wages. Um, it's relatively cheap. So, you know, a tea bag like this is probably five or 10 cents if you're buying it in bulk. And for this type of production system, for farmers, it's really all about yield. Maximizing yield is the best way to maximize their income. Special TT, on the other hand, is often loose leaf, like the one on the right. And it's also often single origin. So this is a um, Phoenix Oolong from a uh, um, tea habitat in LA. I just happened to choose this as an example. And so I know exactly where this tea comes from. Um, it's generally picked and, and processed by better paid workers. Um, it's relatively more expensive. So this is, I picked a very high end example just to give you an idea of the range. This tea goes for, uh, this particular tea goes for $90 an ounce, which is equivalent of probably like 10 or $15 for a mug of tea if you were to brew it Western style. Um, and that's definitely on the higher end, but because there's such a big range, farmers actually have a lot to gain by maximizing quality, even sometimes at the expense of yield. So quality is actually a better predictor of farmer income for specialty tea, and yield is sometimes not a good predictor at all. So specialty tea has uh, more of a uh, potential to live up to this hero crop name because um, it can provide a better um, uh, it can provide a better income for farmers and also they're not pushed to you know maximize yield at the expense of environmental inputs of you know pesticides and fertilizers for example so that's what i'm going to focus on for this talk is specialty tea so the tea plant is attacked by a number of insect pests um, i use the word herbivore in my title and, and herbivore is just something that eats plants so uh, this is one of those insect herbivores the tea green leafhopper um, empoasca onukii it's a major pest on tea plants. It can cause up to a 20% reduction in tea yields. Um, it lays its eggs in the tea shoots in the young stems. And when those eggs hatch, they uh, develop into these nymphs. And the nymphs are uh, super, super tiny when they first hatch out, like less than a millimeter maybe. Um, and then they grow and they molt five times. They progress through five instars and become winged adults. And these winged adults can then disperse uh, I should mention also that the nymphs are, um, even though they don't have wings, they do move around quite a bit and they can jump, hence the name leafhopper, and they're actually quite active and hard to catch. And they reproduce very quickly. They can get up to 15 generations per summer, so they have this huge potential for their population numbers to increase. And the reason they're a pest um, on tea is that they cause a set of symptoms called hopper burn. So they're, they do this by, uh, through their feeding, their cell rupture feeders. Um, they uh, have these straw-like mouth parts that they move up and down and break open cell contents and then drink the fluid. They're only about two or three millimeters long as adults, so they're not really big enough to like take bites out of the leaf, but they do cause the leaves to have stunted growth um, and be uh, thickened and yellowed and kind of curled up at the edges. And sometimes in really bad situations, uh, the leaves turn brown or even fall off. So on the right, we can see some of that typical leafhopper damage. So this, of course, reduces yield, um, but it also alters quality. 
So I've been talking about quality, but I haven't really defined it. Um, for tea, quality is largely all about flavor and health benefits of the tea. And flavor and health benefits are um, a product of um, chemicals that the tea makes, tea plant makes, tea metabolites. And we can kind of think about these in four different categories. So volatiles are chemicals that can evaporate at room temperature or at ambient temperatures, and they often have smells, and so they contribute to tea aroma. Catechins are polyphenols, and more specifically, they're, they're flavanols, and they're responsible for a lot of the health benefits uh, in tea, as well as the uh, taste and aftertaste and mouthfeel in tea. Caffeine, of course, you know what that is. It's a stimulant. It's the reason why many of us drink tea, or, or the main reason. Um, but it also has a bitter taste, so it contributes to quality. And then this last one, L-theanine, is an amino acid. It's the most abundant amino acid in tea. It has an umami flavor, which is really important for quality, especially of uh, Chinese and Japanese teas. Um, and it also has a, a mood altering effect. Um, in high enough concentrations, it can cause sort of a meditative relaxed sensation, which counteracts some of the negative effects of caffeine. But these chemicals don't exist in the tea plant just to make it taste good and make us feel nice. They have evolved um, to deal with um, sources of stress that the plant might experience. So for example, volatiles and catechins can be involved in coping with drought stress. Um, many of the chemicals in plants are defense chemicals and caffeine in particular is neurotoxic to insects and slugs and snails and it's also an antifungal. And then L-theanine is uh, the nitrogen transport mechanism of the tea plant. It's how it brings nitrogen from the soil up to the shoots. So some of these chemicals are present all the time in plants um, and we call those constitutive. So caffeine is more or less constitutive in tea, for example. But other metabolites are what we call induced. And induced metabolites are ones that increase in their concentration after the tea plant experiences some source of stress. So for example, a really common source of stress that plants experience is attack by insects, insect herbivores. So here's a leafhopper on a tea plant. And when that leafhopper starts feeding, the tea plant will defend itself by inducing the production of some chemicals. And these might make the leaf less palatable or slightly toxic to uh, drive the insect away. Um, and those responses can be localized to the, where the, the insect is feeding, but they can also be systemic and uh, induce production of these metabolites throughout the plant, which is sort of prepares it for attack um, in other parts. And that changes the chemistry of the whole plant potentially. And they can also produce um, volatile compounds that carry information about this attack to neighboring organisms, such as predators like this jumping spider. Um, jumping spiders are one of the main predators of leafhoppers, uh, tea green leafhoppers. So hopefully you can see that um, the environment has the potential to change uh, plant chemistry. And that could be through the direct impacts of climate change through drought stress and heat waves and things like that. Or it could be through indirect effects through changes in insect populations, um, which could lead a plant to be in that induced state more often. Now, because these leafhoppers are a pest, um, they're actually, they're uh, also most abundant in the summer, late summer, and because of that, uh, farmers often just avoid harvesting tea in the late summer um, because it's generally lower quality anyways, or if they do harvest tea, they may want to control those insects with some insecticides. However, there are some farmers that actually welcome and encourage attack by leafhoppers. And this is a tea canister on the right that is actually advertising that the tea inside has been attacked by leafhoppers. So why is that? Well, um, the leafhopper attack induces the production of volatiles. So on the right here, there's uh, on the top is a, a gas chromatograph, or both of these are, where each of the little peaks represent a different chemical. And we can see from an intact tea plant, there's not much being produced. But in the leafhopper attacked plants, we have these uh, different chemicals being produced. And it just so happens that those have a really nice smell. They contribute this wonderful honey, fruity, sweet aroma to the tea that improves the tea quality. So the earliest record of this bug bitten tea style was in 1933 with a tea that today is called Eastern Beauty Oolong that was uh, created in Northern Taiwan. Um, 
And this is a really cool strategy because it allows farmers to increase their wholesale prices, produce a higher quality tea, just by essentially not spraying insecticides. Those leafhoppers are around because they're a common tea pest. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, tea quality is generally lower in the summer and that's when these leafhoppers are around. So tea farmers have the potential to boost the quality of their tea at this time of year. Um, and even though the leafhoppers do re re reduce tea yield, that uh, boost in quality uh, makes it a viable strategy. So I'm going to talk to you today about three experiments that I did in this system. Um, the first one will be looking at how um, climate affects leafhopper density and tea plant growth. And then the second uh, experiment is going to look at how changes in leafhopper density affect tea chemistry, which has implications for quality. And then the third one is going to be looking at how plants respond when they're experiencing both uh, herbivory from insects um, at the same time as other sources of stress. So the first experiment, climate effects on leafhopper density and tea growth. So we have some expectations from the literature of how temperature is expected to increase uh, or to, to affect plants and insects, and it's expected to benefit uh, insects more than plants. And that's because as the temperature heats up, um, plants um, protect their water loss by closing the pores on the undersides of their leaves called stomata. And this uh, prevents them from doing photosynthesis as efficiently. And so they're not able to grow as well. And leaf, uh, insects don't have those problems. So their temperature optimum is higher than plants uh, generally. Um, precipitation, the, uh, the predicted effects are less clear and it certainly depends on the, this particular situation. So if a plant is growing in a dry place where it's often drought stressed, well maybe more precipitation is a good thing for growth, but it could also potentially increase the spread of disease. Um, and same goes for insects, uh, that insects can certainly dry out and die from desiccation, but rainfall can also spread spores of, of fungi that uh, infect uh, insects. So the predictions are a little bit less clear. Um, and these are mostly predictions about changes in sort of the mean annual temperature and the mean precipitation. Uh, but there's a, a little bit less work on how uh, changes within a growing season um, at a finer time scale might affect insects. And there's also the potential for there to be delayed effects here. So it could be that high temperatures only affect um, the, the early life stages of an insect, and we actually don't see the effects on the population until much later after those insects have completed their life cycle. So I did this experiment at a tea farm in Fujian province, China, called Shangfu Tea Company. Uh, it's a, a Taiwanese-owned company, um, and uh, so they've, uh, they're producing this bug-bitten tea, and they have this connection to Taiwan for uh, learning how to, how to do this style. Um, I think they started producing it probably around 12 years ago. I can't remember exactly. And this farm has, uh, is quite large, I would say, um, and it has relatively diversified production. So they have multiple fields planted with different cultivars of tea. They produce different types of tea from it. And they also produce sort of a mix of commodity and specialty tea during the late summer. So this is where I stayed, this, uh, this little building here. That was where I lived for the summer. Um, and uh, we've got where the tea workers live and the tea factory back here. And then this is some pigs. <laughs> so I um, randomly chose 10 tea plants in two fields and marked them. And then for 50 days in a row, uh, without any breaks, woke up at 6 a.m. and went out and counted leafhoppers on the underside of leaves. And I chose um, young leaves because that is both the harvest unit for this tea. For Eastern Beauty Oolong, they're picking two leaves in a bud, so just the youngest leaves. And it's also the main feeding site for these leafhoppers. So you can see on the picture on the right, there are three leafhoppers there. Um, and uh, I measured uh, temperature on site with a hobo data logger, and then we uh, collapsed that down to daily temperatures, daily mean temperatures. Um, and then precipitation, we got data from a nearby weather station. Um, and then in the same plants, we labeled and uh, measured the height of shoots, tea shoots, and with that calculated their growth. 
these shoots were um, sort of reset every harvest. The, the fields we were working in were harvested regularly. So we uh, reset the, the measurements every time. And we measured stem diameter and the number of days post-harvest to use as covariates since those might affect shoot growth as well. So for the analysis, I used a distributed lag nonlinear model, which is a relatively complicated technique, but I used it because it allows for um, taking that lag effect, potential lag effect into account. So essentially, you could think about each data point having a, a unique weather history. So we have the, the number of leaf poppers on a particular plant on a particular day, and that could be a result, a function of the weather yesterday, or it could be a function of the weather two days ago or three days ago or so on. So um, this technique uh, fits a, a, a smooth line, a spline, to the relationship between weather and um, shoot growth or leaf hopper density. And it also fits a spline back in time to account for the possibility of delayed effects. So the results showed that shoot growth benefited from warm and dry conditions. So this is um, the results for precipitation. So the way to look at this is going from left to right is dry to wet. Um, and uh, if we look down at the bottom, this is sort of yesterday's weather. And we see that the, the warmest colors are the highest growth. And that's at actually the low end of precipitation with lower growth at higher precipitation. So that's a little weird. But I think essentially what's going on is that these plants are not water limited. And um, because it rains a lot in Fujian province. Um, it was rainy during this study. And so really what's going on is that precipitation is just sort of a proxy for sunlight. If it's raining, it's cloudy and the plants are not getting as much sun and are not able to grow as fast. Um, and then if we go sort of from the bottom up, we go from the weather yesterday to 15 days ago. And as we go back in time, the color becomes more even. And so that indicates that there's really no effect uh, of, of uh, or not a minimal effect of lag. So the weather 15 days ago really has no effect on the shoot growth today, which makes sense because plants are just, you know, growing when the conditions are right. It wouldn't, I wouldn't expect a lag effect here. Temperature had a less strong effect overall, which you can see by the more even color in this plot. Um, and the highest shoot growth was around 26, 27 degrees Celsius with uh, slower growth at higher and lower temperatures, which is what we would expect. Um, there's also a minimal lag effect here. So we have the strongest effect at, of the, the weather you know, yesterday. This is uh, over here at about 12 days ago. It looks like there's some lag effect there, but I have to believe that must be an artifact. I can't imagine why there would be an effect of the weather, the temperature 12 days ago, but not six days ago. Um, yeah. Leafhoppers, on the other hand, uh, we saw sort of the opposite pattern. So their density was the highest under cool and wet conditions. Um, so here's, again, precipitation. And we have the warmest colors, the highest leafhopper density at the highest precipitation that we measured in the experiment. Um, these recent effects are likely behavioral. I can't imagine that leafhopper populations would really increase just overnight um, because of high precipitation. So probably it was that there were more leafhoppers on the leaves that I was looking at, those, uh, the second leaf from the top, those young leaves. Um, however, that's still relevant because those are, again, the leaves that are being harvested. So more leafhoppers on those leaves um, might mean more damage on those leaves and equate to the the quality of the tea potentially. Now there's also some delayed effects here. Um, so this sort of gradient um, continues back a little bit further than uh, in previous plots. And so there may also be some delayed effects of precipitation, meaning that maybe there's increased survival um, at uh, higher precipitations, for example. Now temperature had a less strong effect overall, and it really had no immediate effect. The temperature the, you know, the, the day before measuring uh, is pretty um, even here. But if we go back in time, um, we can see that uh, uh, the temperature nine or 10 days ago did actually have a, a significant effect on leafhopper density. So what I think is happening here is that temperature is likely affecting earlier life stages that are not represented in my counts. So I'm not looking for eggs at all. And the very young first instar nymphs are so, so tiny and move really fast. And it's very likely that I'm really missing them most of the time. Um, so from a related species, Empoasca vitis, um, 
uh, a study found that it takes about six days to go from egg to second instar. And in that study, there was also no egg hatching at all above 23 degrees Celsius mean temperature. Um, and there was higher mortality, uh, or the, uh, the younger nymphs were more sensitive to temperature than older ones. So that could be what's going on here, that uh, high temperatures, or uh, I'm sorry, low temperatures are encouraging uh, higher rates of egg hatching and higher survival of those young nymphs. And it's not showing up in the data until that cohort grows up. So um, in dry weather, we saw faster shoot growth, but lower leafhopper density. And this might equate to um, a lower quality tea situation where producing commodity tea might be more appropriate, whereas wet weather resulted in lower shoot growth and higher leafhopper density, which might result in uh, more high quality tea and more of a specialty tea situation. So it could be beneficial for farmers to be able to ad adapt and switch their production styles depending on the weathers. Um, now, there's a couple twists to this. So one is we did have that delayed effect for the leafhoppers. So if weather it becomes more variable, there's the potential for us to get, you know, combinations with both high shoot growth and high leafhopper density, um, but it gets really difficult to predict. And then the other twist is that we're measuring the leafhopper density, and that doesn't necessarily mean more damage. So it could be that under cool conditions, I'm seeing more leafhoppers because they're not as active, they're not... Uh, afraid of my shadow as much, and maybe they're actually feeding less. So uh, it's a little bit hard to say here um, with that. And so um, uh, one of the things we'll see uh, uh, is in the next study is that they're not necessarily related. Um, okay, so experiment number two is how does leafhopper density affect tea quality? So plants have really complex responses to herbivory. Um, many experiments uh, look at induced volatiles or induced metabolites by comparing the metabolites of plants that are attacked and unattacked in this sort of binary way. Um, and those can often miss things. So few, fewer experiments treat herbivory as a continuous variable, but when they do, they often find sort of interesting and complex patterns of induction. So we can have chemicals that are induced in a density dependent way. So more insects, um, and then that chemical has a higher concentration in the plant, and that slope of that relationship can vary among chemicals or among insects or among plant genotypes. But we could also have, uh, we also see in plants some chemicals that have a threshold effect where there's no induction up until a certain density or uh, amount of damage, and then after which we can have um, a density dependent response or we can have sort of an all or nothing um, response from the, from the plant. And then sometimes we see quadratic effects where the highest concentration of a chemical is actually at some intermediate amount of damage or an intermediate density of insects. And so it's really important to understand how uh, leafhopper density affects tea quality, I think, um, in order to make the adoption of this bug bitten tea strategy um, uh, less limited. So right now it's, it's I mentioned it developed in, in northern Taiwan and that's still where most of this bug bitten tea is produced. There are some places in, in China that are starting to produce it as well as northern um, Vietnam and northern Thailand, but I think it's still really limited and all of those places to my knowledge really have some direct connection to Taiwan and uh, for the knowledge transfer. So it's a risky strategy, you might imagine, right? You know, as a tea farmer, that leafhoppers allowing them to feed on your plants, that is going to decrease your yield. That's a certain. But you don't necessarily know how much it's going to increase the quality, and you don't know how much damage you need. There's not guidelines for this, as far as I know. So we don't know what the relationship with quality is. It could be, we don't know where the slope is to maximize yield and quality simultaneously. And we don't even know if it's a linear relationship, right? We might actually have some intermediate level of leafhopper density that's the best. So as a first step to this, I think it's really important to characterize the relationship between leafhopper density and tea chemistry. So I did this with a manipulative experiment using potted tea plants, also at the Shamfu Tea Company. Um, we grew those plants to start with in these mesh bags on the right uh, to keep them protected from insects for several weeks so they had some new growth. Um, and then I transferred leaf hoppers onto these plants um, in different densities. So that's what I'm doing in that photo there. 
We allowed them to feed for four days. And then at the end, I measured the leafhopper density again as I took them off the plants. And that's because when I was transferring them onto the plants, it's very easy to kill them. Uh, even just touching them with a paintbrush can sometimes squish them. And they're also very fast, so they may have escaped. So I think that the density at the end of the experiment is a better indicator of what the plants were experiencing. In addition to measuring leafhopper density, I also measured leaf damage. And I did this by scanning the leaves on a flatbed scanner and then using a computer program called Fiji with a plugin for this trainable Weka segmentation algorithm. Um, and what this is, is it's a, it's a trainable uh, pixel classification algorithm. So I tell it what a undamaged leaf area looks like, what damaged leaf looks like, and what background looks like and it classifies it into these three different types. So in this photo on the right here, the red pixels are all areas uh, that are damaged, green is undamaged, and purple is background. So then we can calculate the percent damaged leaf area. This is a pretty low amount of damage. Here we have a, a higher amount of damage, about 2%. And you can see these brown spots, that's typical of the leafhopper feeding. It's getting picked up in the red over here. And then here's a pretty heavily damaged leaf. So it's not perfect, but it's a, a different measurement of uh, herbivory than the leafhopper density. So we analyzed the chemistry of the, the plants. Um, for volatiles, we collected um, volatiles from live tea plants using a technique called direct contact absorptive extraction, which is something that Nicole Kafori and I um, created and wrote about in, uh, in uh, the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry. And what it is, is we place this little magnetic stir bar that's coated with a silicone polymer um, that's absorbent. It absorbs the volatiles from the leaf surface and the air around the leaf. And because it's um, a magnet, we can just attach it to the leaf with two little two millimeter diameter neodymium magnets on the top of the leaf. Uh, garbage collection, sorry about that. <laughs> um, we then, I can then put those in a vial and ship them back to Tufts, and we can uh, analyze them with gas chromatography and mass spectrometry to identify and quantify the, the chemicals uh, that the leaf's producing. And then for the non-volatile chemicals, the catechins, caffeine, and L-theanine, um, I dried the leaves using the microwave in the apartment I was staying in, <laughs> because that was all I had at this tea farm. Um, and then we uh, brought those leaves back to Tufts where I extracted those chemicals and analyzed them with liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry to uh, identify and quantify them. Um, so one of the first things that we found, which was kind of interesting, was that there was not a simple linear relationship between our two proxies for herbivory, uh, density and damage. And in fact, it looks almost like there's this threshold here at about 0.5 leaf hoppers per leaf, where under that threshold, there's really no relationship between density and damage. And then after that threshold, we see a linear increase um, in damage with an increase in insect density. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but one thing to keep in mind is that this damage metric, it's measuring the brown spots on the leaf. And those brown spots are caused by the oxidation of catechins. And so if you know anything about, about tea processing, um, that involves the combination of catechins and enzymes in the leaf, uh, such as polyphenol oxidase. And those um, then create uh, uh, theoflavins and theorubigins that are, have a brown color. Um, and so it could be that at that density, we have some change in the leafhopper feeding, but it could also be that there's more catechins, or it could be that there's more of this polyphenol oxidase, which is something that I didn't measure in this study. Oops. So if we treat leafhopper density as our proxy for herbivory, we see that leafhopper density had a significant effect on the volatile blend, um, but, a, but no significant effect on the non-volatiles was interesting. It was a little unexpected. Uh, of the 155 volatiles we identified, or uh, we, we measured in this, um, 35 of them were related to leafhopper density. And most of those were terpenes. And these are um, chemicals that in the literature were often involved with a, a species-specific plant defense. So these are the top nine 
um, chemicals related to leafhopper density. And we have on the x-axis here, leafhopper density. And then on the y is something that we can think of like concentration. So the y-axis of all these different chemicals varies. So the slope of this relationship varies a lot among the different metabolites. And also the shape of that relationship varies. So some of these you can see have a, a pretty linear relationship. This, by the way, is an unknown compound. That's why it just says three there. Um, this is a linear-ish relationship, whereas other of these look like that threshold sort of thing I was describing, where we have sort of low or no production up until a certain point, and then it gets higher. So I wanted to actually quantify the shape. So I fit either a straight line or a step function where we've got sort of a break point a threshold um, to each of these chemicals and asked statistically which one fits the, the data best. And for these top nine compounds, these are our results. So some of these have a, a threshold effect, whereas others have this linear response. Um, and what was interesting is when we looked at all of the metabolites, um, many of the ones that have a threshold response, that threshold is around 0.5 leafhoppers per leaf, which is the same threshold that we saw for the relationship between density and damage. Now, if we overlay some of the uh, aroma percepts of these, you can see that most of them have a pleasant sounding aroma. And so probably we're getting increases in quality as leafhopper density increases with a potential threshold at that 0 0.5 insects per leaf. Now, if we treat damage as our proxy for herbivory instead, we see that damage is only marginally significant um, as an uh, having effect on volatile blend. Um, and it's actually a different set of volatile compounds that are related with damage. So out of 155 volatiles, we measured or we found 22 were related to damage, and it was a different set. And these were mostly um, what we call green leaf volatiles. These are six carbon compounds that tend to be induced as a more general response to herbivory. Their precursors are essentially broken bits of cell membrane. So um, just mechanical damage to a leaf produces these. It's the, sun, the smell of, of cut grass is these green leaf volatiles. So here again are the top nine uh, chemicals that were related to damage. And we see, again, there's a lot of variation in the shapes of these responses. Um, here we've got one that's you know, dropping in a, a concentration as we get more damage, but that's probably a good thing since isovaleric acid smells sour, cheesy, and rancid. Uh, so we don't want that in our tea, <laughs> probably. Um, but many of these, these sort of green smelling chemicals are actually not great for tea quality um, sometimes. Diene diol one down here is a really interesting one because it doesn't have any smell itself, but it's a precursor to another chemical called hotrienol that has been identified to be the key uh, aroma component of Eastern Beauty Oolong. And so this is actually a really important chemical here. Um, and it also goes to show you that a lot changes during tea processing. So even though I can sort of make predictions about what's happening in the live tea plant, we need more farm to cup studies to really say something um, confidently about how uh, quality is relating to leafhopper density and leaf damage. So one thing I learned from this is that using these two different proxies for herbivory was actually really insightful and that damage and density may not actually be measuring the same thing. So the metabolites that were closely related to damage were more like the response that we would see from mechanical damage of a leaf, whereas the metabolites that were responding to density were more like um, metabolites we would expect uh, that were uh, related to leafhopper feeding. So I think if you have the opportunity to measure multiple proxies for herbivory, it is worthwhile. And if you have disagreement with those two, um, it's just an opportunity to learn more about uh, what's actually being measured in your system. We also found that leafhopper density does matter for tea quality. Um, 11 of those uh, metabolites were density dependent in their induction, and about eight of them had a threshold type induction where the threshold was near that 0.5 leafhoppers per leaf. So my prediction is sort of that there's this jump in quality after that leafhopper density, although like I said, it's really difficult to make predictions about quality without more farm to cup studies because so much happens to, these, to the chemistry of the tea leaf during tea processing. Okay. So the third experiment, I'll talk about how drought and insect herbivory interact to affect tea chemistry. And another way to think about this is, will this bug-bitten tea strategy work 
if plants are experiencing other sources of stress at the same time. So we have some possible expectations for this. Uh, so plants that are under drought stress um, often respond by inducing the production of plant hormones and metabolites that are shared with herbivore-induced responses. So for example, jasmonic acid is a plant hormone that is often thought of as being the, the first response for um, uh, mechanical damage and herbivore damage, but it's actually also induced during drought stress. So it may be that drought stressed plants are actually really prepared for dealing with a similar source of stress or bivory, or maybe it is similar to them in terms of how they react. And it may be that uh, drought stressed plants have an increase in their induced response to insect herbivores. On the other hand, drought makes plants unhappy. Um, it inhibits photosynthesis. If they're not photosynthesizing, they're not producing sugars, they're not have, they may not have the raw building blocks to produce those induced metabolites. Um, and so we might expect actually that the opposite, that drought decreases the induced response of plants. So I tested these predictions um, in an experiment at the Boston Area Climate Experiment, in, uh, also called BASE in Waltham, Massachusetts. Um, and the setup here is these plots with um, these, uh, this kind of roof over it, um, where we have these polycarbonate slats that block rainfall. And by placing these in different spacings, we can uh, block different amounts of rainfall. So at the, at, the, at the experiment or at base, we had plots that um, didn't have any of those slats and they let 100% of the rain through and just got ambient rainfall. There were plots that um, only let 75% of the rain through, and there were plots that only let half of the rain through. And so this is going from least drought stress to most drought stressed. And each of those plots were replicated three times. So uh, Colin actually planted tea plants out there, um, and they uh, stayed out there for the summer and experienced different degrees of drought stress for about two months. And then when I got back from China, um, I uh, sprayed the plants either with methyl jasminate or a control. And so methyl jasminate is a plant hormone. It's often used to simulate herbivory because it is a hormone that's produced in response to insect herbivores and causes a cascade of reactions um, and, and induction of chemicals. Um, and it's easier to control than insects. And also we don't have leaf hoppers in Boston, so we couldn't use leaf hoppers for this experiment. We don't have tea green leaf hoppers rather, I should say. Um, and then we sampled the volatiles from these plants again by direct contact absorptive extraction. We also measured non-volatiles, but I'm not going to talk about those results today. So uh, out of 128 volatiles that we um, detected, 42 of those were um, related to the methyl jasminate spray, were induced. And for most of those metabolites, their induction was inhibited by drought stress. So here's a, uh, an example. We have in red the methyl jasminate treatment, and in blue is our control treatment. And then in each of these, for each of these chemicals, we have drought stress increasing from left to right. And then this is on the y-axis again as sort of a measure, uh, you can think of it as concentration. So for ethyl 4 ethoxybenzoate, um, it's really not produced at all in the control plants. It's really only in um, plants that have this methyl jasminate treatment, but the strength of that induction um, goes down with increasing drought stress. And that was the pattern that we saw again for the, the majority of these uh, induced metabolites. However, there were a few metabolites, six, that were actually enhanced by drought stress. Um, and we shouldn't discount these because some of these were actually really important metabolites. So one of them is methyl salicylate. Methyl salicylate is a, another plant hormone that is often induced in response to certain kinds of insect herbivores. And it has the potential to create a lot of downstream changes in plant metabolism, um, potentially things that we didn't detect in the volatile pro profile as well. And then EE-alpha farnesine is a terpene that is um, often reported as an attractant for predators and parasitoids that can uh, act as an indirect defense for a plant. So um, even though it's just a few metabolites, this is uh, an important thing to notice. So here, 
plants responded differently under multiple sources of stress. So I think it's really important in climate change studies to include uh, multiple things that plants are going to experience. They're not going to experience drought stress on their own, but they're potentially also going to experience changes in insect herbivory because of the effects of climate change on insect populations. And they're potentially going to experience other things like changes in CO2 concentration and ozone. And I think it's important to do more studies that look at the combinations of those variables because there can be interactive effects as we saw here, not just additive effects. Um, and it also means that this bug bitten tea strategy might not work as well if tea plants are experiencing some other source of stress like drought. So um, this could help inform strategies for tea farmers as well. So to wrap things up in general, um, I found that rainy weather in the summer might increase leafhopper density in Fujian province. And those increases in leafhopper density um, could result in a change in the induced chemistry of the tea plant with this potential threshold of around 0.5 leaf hoppers per leaf, where we have a more drastic change in the chemistry after that, which potentially could be um, a target for sort of a minimum uh, density to make a bug bitten tea. And I also found that induction might be inhibited with other sources of stress. So it's pretty, I think, unlikely that Fujian is going to be experiencing major drought stress um, in the near future. Um, but uh, in other places, uh, I know in Taiwan, I think last year they got hit pretty bad with a drought. And so that might be actually an important um, thing to consider uh, if we have drought stress at the same time as um, we're trying to make bug bitten tea, that strategy might not work as well. So, um, I think one of the things I learned from this PhD or something that I want to sort of encourage people to do is to conduct more studies that are more complex and more realistic and include things like treating herbivory as a continuous variable or interactions between multiple sources of stress um, or taking lagged effects into account. Um, I think that as we develop more uh, tools, both statistical and sort of field design tools, field sampling tools for chemistry. I think that we um, need to do more studies like this because we can find uh, really important complex patterns that are not um, obvious in with simpler experimental designs all the time. And I think that these uh, uh, complex changes in plant chemistry are really important to understand because they have the potential to instruct to structure entire food webs. So they affect the, the, the herbivores that eat the plants, um, as well as predators that are attracted to those um, damaged plants. Um, and also, you know, changes in the leaf chemistry affect leaf decomposition rates. So that affects microbial communities. So there's these big cascading effects of tea chemistry. And I think it's important to um, really understand how climate change will impact tea chemistry in order to make better predictions about the environmental impact of, of all the different things that come with climate change. And also, I think that this strategy of taking advantage of plant stress is a really potentially viable climate adaptation strategy. This bug bitten tea was, at least as the story goes, discovered by accident. Um, and so I think it's possible that there are many other crops where the quality is dependent on chemicals that are essentially defense chemicals, things like hops, herbs and spices, um, or even you know, recreational and medical cannabis, where there's the potential that some level of insect damage is actually beneficial for quality and can outweigh any reductions in yield. And I think that that could be a viable um, adaptation strategy to uh, reduce you know, chemical inputs on, on, uh, on crops and uh, adapt to climate change. So with that, I want to thank a bunch of people. Um, I want to thank my committee, um, uh, Colin Oriens, Elizabeth Crone, Jan Pachenik, George Elmore, and John Beck for coming um, or agreeing to come from Florida, but now not going anywhere, <laughs> um, but joining uh, via the, the video. Um, and I also want to thank Sarah Lewis. She was not on my committee, but she was a really great mentor for me. And I really appreciated all her advice on, on teaching and research and all sorts of things, career things. Um, Colin, you've been a really excellent advisor. I think that um, uh, one thing that I really appreciate about you is your ability to, to adapt your advising strategy to my career goals and also to, to keep checking in with me about what those career goals are because um, they change sometimes and being really flexible about that. And I also really appreciate your um, 
uh, uh, ability to sort of um, help me think on the bright side of things when I've had experiments that don't go right and I'm really just stuck in the weeds and not thinking about the bigger picture and you've helped me um, be better about that. Uh, so I do really appreciate that and I really enjoyed um, being your student and I've learned a lot. Um, I also want to thank all my collaborators and co-authors, which I'm sure I've forgotten some people, um, but I especially want to thank uh, Nicole and Amanda. Uh, you guys have been really awesome and they've, you know, run all the volatile samples for me and helped me so, so much with the analysis of the data. And they both worked so incredibly hard at um, uh, doing everything in the, in the robot lab that they did. Um, and I just, uh, really great collaborators, had a wonderful experience working with both of you, um, especially Nicole. I think we had a, a, a really awesome time learning together, um, and I, I really appreciate it. I also want to thank everyone at the T Research Institute, but especially Professor Han. Um, uh, he, Professor Han, you um, did everything to, to make my stay there um, comfortable and made sure that I have everything I needed for my research for successful field seasons. Um, and you did things like uh, force your students to speak English in lab meeting <laughs> on uh, my benefit. And I really appreciate everything that you did over the years for me. And I hope to come back soon and visit um, and work with you again. Um, and I also want to thank everyone in the Han lab who I don't have everybody pictured here again. One thing I've learned about uh, making these acknowledgement slides is that I'm not very good at remembering to take pictures of people. So there are definitely people missing from all of these slides. So uh, if you're not on there, don't take it personally. Um, I especially want to thank two members of the Han lab. I want to thank Li Xin. Uh, Li Xin is um, one of the most positive, energetic people that I've ever met. Uh, he was so incredibly busy, but um, took so much time to make sure that I had everything that I needed there. Um, and, and not just, you know, for research and for um, uh, collaborating on experiments, but also things like, you know, taking me shopping and um, uh, helping me just adjust to, uh, to living in China. Um, and I really want to thank Wei Ji Pong as well. He, he came to the Han lab um, and actually joined a summer early because I was looking for someone that could help me as an interpreter. And he just became so much more. Um, he's a really wonderful, genuine person. He's a great scientist. Um, and uh, he's also a really good friend. And I'm just, it's, I'm super, super happy that, that we met. Um, and I, again, hope to see you both again and uh, work with you again in the future. Um, I have a lot of undergraduates that have worked on these projects with me, and I just have pictures of a few of them. Um, people at Tufts, as well as um, undergraduates um, working in China, um, I've been very lucky to have all these wonderful people helping me out with this project. I also want to really thank Shamfu Tea Company um, for essentially giving me a place to live and feeding me for free, and also brewing me amazing tea every day. And um, taking me out to dinner and, and uh, drinks and things like that. Um, this on the left here is uh, the general manager, Mr. Liu. Um, and uh, here's Mr. Tsung. He's the owner of Shanfu Tea Company. He let us essentially stay in his apartment um, at the tea farm. So that was very generous of him. And then his brother, uh, this is uh, another Mr. Liu, his older brother here, he um, was very great about keeping us informed about the harvest schedule and things like that so that our experiments really went smoothly. I wanna thank the Cron Cronians Lab Group. I think this is maybe our only group photo, which is pretty sad, but it's actually kind of fortunate that we have this Zoom thing going on so we could get a group photo. Um, and so you guys have all been really wonderful at giving me feedback on, on my research and it's great to hear about uh, such a uh, such a diverse array of uh, science um, in our lab meetings and uh, and social events and things like that. And then Avalon's here too as well. She started joining our lab meetings. Uh, and I want to thank Avalon too. She's been my TA this semester. Um, she's also been moderating this Zoom call. And uh, she's just been really incredibly great at uh, building community in sort of this quarantine time. Um, and I just want to say I really appreciate that. I think it's it's been... Uh, really great to have that. Uh, all my friends at Tufts, again, I don't have pictures of all of you because I suck at taking pictures, but all of my Tufts friends um, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, everything. And all of my friends at home for being really patient for, with me and um, 
you know, feels like we just sort of pick up where we left off every time we talk. And I want to thank all my friends in uh, at the Tea Research Institute in China for welcoming me and inviting me to things, even though I can't speak Chinese. Um, I want to thank just the tea community in general, which this is not a photo of, um, but it's a, an example of when I had to go to Taiwan to renew my visa. And I just went on Facebook and said, uh, who wants to meet up for tea and met up with like five or six people um, from the tea community. And that's what the tea community is like. And being able to communicate my science with you is and have people appreciate it is the best treatment for imposter syndrome. Um, and so I really, really appreciate that I have this community of people. Um, I want to thank my parents, uh, my dad. Um, I, so I think, you know, kids are sort of born scientists and um, you just have to encourage them to, 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 to get them to be good scientists. And I think that both my parents did that. Um, my dad uh, took me camping every summer of my childhood uh, with my cousins and friends and let me have probably uh, much too of a much too free of a rain uh, to just kind of wander around and explore and uh, hike and eat wild edible plants and not be too freaked out about it um, and take me fishing and things like that um, and that really developed my skills as a naturalist um, and of course I want to thank my mom uh, she also introduced me to nature and um, took me hiking and she also you know taught me to, to teach myself. And so anytime I had a question as a kid, we would look it up in the encyclopedia or we would go to the library. And so, you know, she sort of taught me how to, how to dive into the primary literature in a manner of speaking. Um, and I really appreciate that. It's definitely made me the person I am today. Um, and of course, I want to thank my wife, Lindsay, who's, oh, she must be hiding in the bedroom, but she would not be behind me. Um, <laughs> You, uh, Dr. Lindsay Troyer, has been incredibly supportive of me this entire time. And even though she knew what I was getting into, um, because she's been through it before, uh, has supported me this entire time. And um, I'm very lucky to have somebody that has gone through this and knows what it's like and understands the 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 understands what it's all about. Um, and I just really appreciate everything you've done for me, especially in these last few weeks. You've been doing uh, far more than your fair share of, of housework and things like that and keeping me fed and, and uh, not too stressed. So I really appreciate it and I love you. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the audience. And uh, these are my funding sources also, NSF. Um, Chinese Academy for Agricultural Sciences, Tufts Institute for the Environment, and I guess Shanfu Tea Company as well.